The Great Gatsby, Chapter 4, Section 3. With fenders spread like wings, we scattered light through half Astoria. Only half, for as we twisted among the pillars of the elevated, I heard the familiar jug, 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 spat of a motorcycle, and the frantic policeman rode alongside. All right, old sport, called Gadsby. We slowed down. Taking a white card from his wallet, he waved it before the man's eyes. Oh, right you are, agreed the policeman, tipping his cap. Uh, Know you next time, Mr. Gadsby. Excuse me. What was that? I inquired. The picture of Oxford? I was able to do the commissioner a favor once, and he sends me a Christmas card every year. Over the great bridge, with the sunlight through the girders making a constant flicker upon the moving cars, with the city rising up across the river in white heaps and sugar lumps, all built with a wish out of non-olfactory money. The city seen from the Queensboro Bridge is always the city seen for the first time in its first wild promise of all the mystery and the beauty in the world. A dead man passed us in a hearse, heaped with blooms, followed by two carriages with drawn blinds and by more cheerful carriages for friends. The friends looked out at us with the tragic eyes and short upper lips of southeastern Europe, and I was glad that the sight of Gadsby's splendid car was included in their somber holiday. As we crossed Blackwell's Island, a limousine passed us, driven by a white chauffeur in which sat three modish negroes, two bucks and a girl. I laughed aloud as the yokes of their eyeballs rolled towards us in haughty rivalry. Anything can happen now that we've slid over this bridge, I thought. Anything at all. Even Gatsby could happen without any particular wonder. Roaring noon in a well-fanned 42nd Street cellar. I met Gadsby for lunch. Blinking away the brightness of the street outside, my eyes picked him out obscurely in the anteroom, talking to another man. Uh, Mr. Carraway, this is my friend, Mr. Wolfsheim. A small, flat-nosed Jew raised his large head and regarded me with two fine growths of hair which luxuriated in either nostril. After a moment, I discovered his tiny eyes in the half-darkness. So, I took one look at him, said Mr. Wolfsheim, shaking my hand earnestly, and what do you think I did? What? I inquired politely, but evidently he was not addressing me, for he dropped my hand and covered Gatsby's with his expressive nose. I handed him the money, I handed the money to Katzpah, and I said, All right, Katzpah, don't pay him a penny till he shuts his mouth. He shut it then and there. Gatsby took an arm of each of us and moved forward into the restaurant, whereupon Mr. Wolfsham swallowed a new sentence he was starting and lapsed into a somnambulatory abstraction. Highballs? asked the head waiter. This is a nice restaurant here, said Mr. Wolfshin, looking at the Presbyterian nymphs on the ceiling, but I like across the street better. Um, yes, highballs, agreed Gatsby, and then to Mr. Wolfshin, it's too hot over there. Hot and small, yes, said Mr. Wolfshin, but full of memories. Um, what place is that, I asked. The old metropole. The old metropole, brooded Wolfshin gloomily, filled with faces dead and gone, filled with friends gone now forever. I can't forget, so long as I live, the night they shot Rosie Rosenthal there. It was six of us at the table, and Rosie had had eat and drunk a lot all evening. When it was almost morning, the waiter came up to him with a funny look and says, somebody wants to speak to him outside. All right, says Rosie, and begins to get up. And I I pulled him down in his chair. 
Let the bastards come in here if they want you, Rosie. But don't you, so help me, move outside this room. It was four o'clock in the morning then, and if we'd raised the blinds, we'd have seen daylight. Did he go? I asked innocently. Sure he went, Mr. Wolfshin's nose flashed at me indignantly. He turned around in the door and says, don't let the waiter take away my coffee. Then he went out on the sidewalk and they shot him three times in his full belly and drove away. Four of them were electrocuted, I said, remembering. Five with Becker. His nostrils turned to me in an interested way. I understand you are looking for a business connection? The juxtaposition of these two remarks was startling. Gatsby answered for me. Oh, oh no, he explained. Uh, this isn't the man. No? Mr. Wolfshin seemed disappointed. Uh, this is just a friend. Uh, I told you we'd talk about that some other time. I beg your pardon, said Mr. Wolfshin. I, I had the wrong man. A succulent hash arrived, and Mr. Wolfshin, forgetting the more sentimental atmosphere of the old metropole, began to eat with ferocious delicacy. His eyes, meanwhile, roved very slowly all around the room. He completed the arc by turning to inspect the people directly behind. I think that, except for my presence, he would have taken one short glance beneath our own table. Um, look here, old sport said Gatsby, leaning toward me. I'm afraid I made you a little angry this morning in the car. There was that smile again, but this time I held out against it. I don't like mysteries, I answered, and I don't understand why you won't come out, frankly, and tell me what you want. Why has it all got to come through Miss Baker? Oh, it, 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 it's nothing underhand, he assured me. Miss Baker's a great sportswoman, you know, and She'd never do anything that wasn't all right. Suddenly, he looked at his watch, jumped up, and hurried from the room, leaving me with Mr. Wolfsheim at the table. <laughs>